Hey, One Church family, I hope you're doing fantastic today. Thanks for coming to church and being with us. Um, I am out of town because I went to go visit Wit and Jamie Jones, who launched their ministry from this church, and we are some of their biggest supporters. They have an incredible FCA ministry in Bozeman, Montana. And so they're suffering for the Lord in Montana, and so I went to go see them and see all the ministry that they do, but also do some hiking at Glacier National Park and Yellowstone. And so be praying for them and their ministry, but also praying for us as we get some time away uh, to celebrate our anniversary and all of that. But today, you are in for a treat. And I uh, am so blessed to have one of my favorite humans on the planet be with us in our house. And so today, you're going to have a guest speaker named K.P. Yohannan. KP is one of the most well-known missionaries throughout the world. He's actually established in over 60 countries, 60. And he's uh, actually built 56 uh, Bible colleges and raised up 19,000 19, ministry leaders throughout the world. And so what, what an incredible man. His heart for the Lord is unbelievable. His knowledge of the scriptures is so beautiful. But when you hear him start talking about Jesus and the gospel, you're just going to fall in love with him. He, he's precious. Um, he's authored over 200 books. And I hope that you guys got to get one of his books and enjoyed it this week. But you guys need to do me a favor right now. I need you to get rowdy. Put your hands together for KP Yo Hannon. Thank you. So I'm debating if I should speak in English or... <laughs> when I first came to America, that was 19... Oh, there you are. I, I was... apologize. No problem. I was enjoying the worship. Um, <clears throat> it was in 1974, yeah. For two weeks, no matter what I said, those people in Dallas, Texas, they would say, what did he say? Can you repeat that? And I mean, two weeks you go through that and you say, what is wrong with these people? Richard Schaefer, who was in college with me at that time, he said, oh, KP, just don't worry about it. You speak English and they speak Texan. <laughs> that made my day. <coughs> Talking to Pastor Blake um, a week ago, I think I was really, really glad someone I felt so real and now met his daughters and being part of the worship here makes me very, very happy. Um, lead like Jesus. The scripture I want to read for you is in First John chapter 2 verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. In the Living Bible, I think the verse goes like this. Anyone who says he's a Christian should live as Christ did. The big question is, is this possible? Some years ago, I went through the four Gospels with a pencil in hand, marking incidents and Bible verses that describe the behavior of Christ the man. Oh, yeah, yeah, I... I worship him as God. He's my Lord. He's creator of the universe. But I just want to see this man who was hungry and thirsty and weary and, 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 and slept and, and got upset, uh, who was discouraged and frustrated, um, walked for miles and miles and miles and um, I just want to see this man. And then I'm told 
in Hebrews, he is my forerunner. The one who went before me so I can follow his example. Christianity is, is, is quite weird sometimes because we think knowing all the information, all the doctrines correctly and having all correct moral behavior is to be a godly Christian. It is not. If you, if you study that. Because the Pharisees were absolutely impeccable in their behavior. Giving and religious systems and everything. But they said, all of you are going to hell. Because he said, the problem is you are so engrossed about your own spirituality and your happiness, your entertainment, your knowledge, and studying the Bible so literally. Yet, that scripture talks about me, and you don't want to follow me. And so, going through those scripture portions helped me to realize I have to make deliberate choices. Say no to a multitude of things and choose to do things that I hate to do to be like Jesus. Well, Bangladesh is a country that almost every year they have a typhoon, something happens and millions of people you know, perish in one year, one of those massive crises the pictures were very vivid in the media of hundreds of thousands of people that perished and then mothers climbing on trees, carrying the little babies. Their houses are drowned, their slum is drowned, everything is gone, at least save the little kids. And then the water rises and not only the baby dies, but the mother dies. And they talked about 100,000 people escaping with their life. I never forget, after reading and seeing those pictures, I became kind of deeply saddened, deeply hurting. Not about what I saw, not about all those things that just happened. It was about how my heart was so objective, my reasons and emotions so objective. I looked at it, but it didn't make my heart break. It didn't cause me to think maybe tonight I should not sleep but pray and weep on their behalf. It did make me to think my plan to buy whatever stuff I was going to buy. No, I will not do that. And it was a time of repentance. I wish I could say I learned my lessons and I'm a wonderful follower of Christ. No, it's a daily repentance learning. But lead like Jesus, it involves my feelings, my emotions, my money, my hand, my leg, and my decisions, my relationships, and what I listen to, and everything else. You know all that. And Pastor Blake will teach you a lot more about it. But I want to particularly focus on one thing. If you follow Christ, then your children will follow you. Your friends, you can't help, but they will think, what on earth is this? I want this life. But for me, when I was barely 17, I heard an American named George Werwer speaking at a conference in Bangalore, India. 
and after speaking about Christ's call to forsake all and follow him, loving Christ more than husband, wife, father, mother, brother, sister, your own life, and all that, his invitation was simple. I invite you to come, die, and live. Well, that was the night I hardly could sleep. Toward 2.30 in the morning or so, I was on my knees and I simply prayed a small prayer. Jesus, I don't have money to give. I don't have degrees to give. I don't have anything. You're asking me to give everything I have and nothing. All I have is a fragile little skinny body of mine. And if you want, you can have it. But that decision took me 2,000 miles to North India to hundreds of villages with other young people where we would ask, have you heard of Jesus? The normal response from people went like this. Did you say Jesus? They say, yeah. You know, we've been living here 30, 40, 50 years. No one by that name live here. Maybe you can find him in the next village. <laughs> At first we thought it was a joke. But then it repeated hundreds of times. My dear brothers and sisters, there's no reason to feel guilty or condemned or feel bad about the house or clothes or car or privilege God has blessed you with. But let us remember, he is not walking on earth anymore. He is sitting in heaven. He paid the price for the salvation of the whole world. Anyone who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Romans 10. But how can they call on his name if they never heard that name? How can they hear unless somebody go and tell them? How can somebody go unless somebody send them? Here we are in this incredible privileged nation. We have the opportunity to send thousands and thousands of brothers and sisters in Africa, in India, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, everywhere. If only we can invest our time to pray for them and give them even few dollars a month, like $30 a month, whatever, so that they can be trained, they can go. Because like, I never been to Bhutan. We have thousands of missionaries throughout Asian nations the leading people to Christ. Like, it's, it's, it's normal now, no less than 11 churches are planted every single day among people that never heard Christ. Not because I'm a Bhutanese. i never been there. But we have brothers and sisters in Bhutan who were trained, who are going out. But I never forget, I was in California a few years ago, speaking at a pastor's conference and made a commitment I will make a telephone call to Bhutan and pray over a new church, not church building, but it's a huge house kind of thing they built where the new converts now can come to uh, for worship. So I made the telephone call. And I could hear the pastor and the noise, everything's going on. And I said, how many people you got here? He said, 300. I said, what? I never could imagine that. I said, where do you get that people from? He said, all of them came to know the Lord. I'm told miracle of demon possessions being healed and sick people got healed, all kinds of stories. And I prayed and, 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 and the Lord's blessing on them. Then I sat on my bed in that room, in the hotel room, and began to weep. Saying to myself, this is unbelievable. i never been there. I don't speak the language. But God in his mercy gave me the privilege to go to some church like this one. Some in Canada.
Canada or Europe or somewhere and talk to them about the possibility to reach the most unreached in our generation if only we can link our lives with them through prayer and help. And somebody helped that brother to go to the community and preach the gospel. How, how did he do that? He wanted to follow Christ in his footsteps and, and, and as he was going, you and I became the reason for that question to be answered. How will they go unless they be sent? Just a couple of months ago, something quite interesting happened. I was in Dallas and calling to one of our mission leaders in one of the most unreached, difficult community in Asia. And yeah, it just happened to be when I was 18, 19 years of age, I happened to be in that particular place also, you know, sharing the gospel with a group of young people. And he said, oh, I've just been walking the last three hours. I said, for what? He said, oh, we are going to this particular community where there is, we have a new church. I said, I've been there. I know the place. Finally, I hear the amazing news. They got over 200 people that have come to Christ in that community and the people themselves built the temporary church building with stones and sticks and whatever they can find to worship the Lord. And I asked the question, how did that all happen? He said, there happened to be in that village a woman who was demon possessed for seven years and nothing, whatever the religious they did, nothing could help her but two, three villages away one of our missionaries, native missionary heard about it and went with some of his believers and prayed for her and she was healed instantly that whole thing began this new beginning of people hearing about Christ the Lord and began to believe in Christ and that's a whole new church in a whole new place, the first church in the community. Saint Paul said this, follow me as I follow Christ. You read the life of Paul in 2 Corinthians and Acts and everywhere. Well, GFA World, which I imagine you got a copy of this um, book. Um, I like this book, you know, one of the reasons? No, I wrote this. <laughs> or four million copies in print in many languages. But the best thing is in the back of the book. The two photographs, small ones. One, when I was 19, I looked like a movie star. <laughs> but the next picture, when I was 68 or something like that, 65, an old man. I just can't imagine what happened between those years. I don't know if you ever heard the name George Burns, the guy who played Oh God movie. He had this fascinating line when he sang this song. I wish I was 18 again. That will never happen to me. How old are you? Don't worry, you don't have to say it. Add 100 years to that now. You're not sitting where you're sitting. You're not driving the car. You're not living in that house. You're not going to purchase all the stuff that you're dreaming about. Jesus lived in the light of eternity. And his only concern was to die on the cross to redeem the world. And if we can follow in his footsteps, 
we will end up trying to do something among three billion people in our generation that never had a chance to hear his name. And most of them are in Asian countries and in Africa. But you are not going to go there to live there forever and I can't. But we can do something to change the course of these nations and communities by linking our lives with the brothers and sisters we call native missionaries. So they can, they can both and preach the gospel in the community, they can go to the near community, and then cross-culturally. We have right now nine missionaries from India and Nepal working in Rwanda, Africa. They started two churches, all happened in seven months. One, they got over 500 people. People that never went to church. So how is that possible? Those nine missionaries are there. They are not big salaried people just meeting their basic needs. Someone like you saying, I will pray for them and I can give them $30 a month or whatever I have. Or there are some people who actually help 20, 30, 50 missionaries every month. And so amazing what it does. Well, I want to conclude by saying a, a real story that is very part of my life. I grew up in a tiny village in the southern part of India. And my mother was an incredibly a godly person, hardly five feet tall and very small, fragile. But growing up in that home, in that tiny village, she was strange. Strange in the sense there was something about her life. She was living for some other world. Very happy and joyful. When I was growing up, I hear this statement she will make often. Whom have I in, whom have I in heaven but you and on earth I desire nothing and no one beside you. I didn't know what she was talking about. Only much later, I would learn that is a Bible verse in Psalm 73, verse 25. And she prayed no less than three hours or more every single day in prayer. And she fasted often for days, at least once a year, 40 days continually. When I was growing up in that home, I knew that she loved the Lord more than anything else. When I finished my high school, I remember coming to my parents and saying, they will allow me, I like to. But my thinking was actually go for a summer outreach with a group of young people from Operation Mobilization. So I asked for permission before I could finish my request she jumped up from the bench she was sitting on by the dining table and said, you go. I thought, oh my, I was an accident. <laughs> she hated me. <laughs> well, I didn't know. So there I went to hear George Werber and went off to North India 2,000 miles and after two years coming back home, She was cooking with the firewood in the kitchen. She said, why don't you sit down here? I'll tell you a story that you do not know. Then she started. Do you remember the day you came and asked if you could go to work with this team to serve the Lord and learn whatever? Yeah, mother, I remember that very well. She said, but you don't know this part of the story. I prayed all my life that one of my six boys, and I happen to be the youngest, will give his life to serve God. And your older brothers, one by one, went to the business and farming and all that, I completely lost my hope. But then, as you were growing up shy and timid and skinny, 
Well, you don't think I'm skinny? I ate enough hamburgers here. <laughs> she said, I just completely lost my hope then that you will, you will do nothing with your life like that. But then she said, I decide to fast and pray. Three and a half years, she prayed every Friday, praying, God, please, before I die, have one of my son commit his life to serve you. And the day when you said that, I knew God answered my prayer. First time for me to hear the story. 1990, I was flying to South Korea from the United States to speak at a mission conference and I heard my mother was sick, taken to the hospital and I canceled my trip from Mumbai and then went down south. And she was 84. And that weekend, six o'clock in the morning or so, she passed away. The saddest day of my life. After the funeral, our brothers, we six of us met to talk about our mother, our father went to be with the Lord earlier. And one question asked by one of my brother who's a businessman, he said, anyone know how much money our mother left in the bank? Well, without explaining too much to you, we all imagine she will have a huge amount of money somewhere in the bank. Answering the question, one of my brother pulled out a notebook and said, I found this under the pillow of our mother's bed. And he flipped the pages. I was terribly curious. And he said, pages after pages, names of people on the mission field, studying in Bible school all over the place. And she never been away from our community. That she was sending money to them every month. And then he concluded, as far as I know, there is nothing she left behind. And I remembered two years prior to her departing, I was visiting with her and I was so upset, so angry because she was wearing a, a, a dress, blouse they call it, torn up and hand stitched like a Mickey Mouse job. I said, mother, what is wrong? Don't you feel concern for your children? You're putting cow dung and, and shame on our face and our head. That's a native talk. Because in, in our culture, when you don't take care of your parents, people think you are worse than devil. And she had money to buy a new dress if she won every month. And I never forget, she looked at me and smiled and said, you little boy don't understand nothing. Someday you will. Here, sitting in the room with my brothers, it is like she walked back into the room, put her arm around me and whispering in my ears, my son, now you understand. Yes, I could have purchased anything I wanted, but I lived something else. You know the last thing she left for us to do? These are the words. When I'm dead and gone, the only thing I leave behind it's going to be my wedding ring, my earrings, and the gold chain my husband gave me when I was 19. That's when she got married. Sell these items and give the money to preach the gospel among people that never heard Christ's name, I want to meet them also in heaven. You can imagine, I began to weep, and I did. Well, orthodox in my faith, we don't believe people die, people depart. Hebrews 12, I'm certain she, she can hear and see exactly what's happening here. And if she could talk, she will say to you, well, that's my little boy. 
And she will say, I never knew that he would travel all over the world and he will do what he did with his life. But I am glad that I made the choice not to spend my money on myself. I made the choice to pray and fast. I made the choice to suffer. And I would encourage you. You know what? I, I, obviously you figured it out. I travel quite a lot. But I've never been to a country in my life where people are more kind and gracious and helpful and loving than Americans. This is an amazing country. GFA world could start tens of thousands of churches and send missionaries because there are so many countries help us, but the people here is, is more than anybody else. And today, Mike and I traveled here, and we brought with us a couple of hundred missionaries. These are native missionaries. People speak in their own language, eat their food, live like them, simple lives, but preaching the Lord Jesus Christ to those that never heard it. And what I like you to do, if your heart feels to do it, we got all of them stacked up on the table out there. You take one or two or two, 10 or 50 or all 200. Well, there are some people who support 30, 40 missionaries and they have a little more money than I have. I'm happy for that. And so you can start praying for them today, your family. And, and the number of families we support as a family, you know, they're right there next to the dining table so we can pray for them. And of course, this book talks about that. And every penny you give and every prayer you offer will result leading others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And please don't do it out of guilt or condemnation or, no, it's not that. And if your heart says to do it, by faith you do it. And meanwhile, I assure you, 100 years from now, you and I will be having a celebration throughout eternity with millions of people that have come to Christ from all these nations, from every color, every tribe, every kindred, every nation that rejoice forever. And that's our portion. And there are a couple of pictures they want to put up, especially one picture where you can see a church with the lots of people. It's a real place and the thousands like that. The Lord bless you. Shimmering water, steamy jungles, and rustic huts. An amazing hidden paradise, at least at first glance. These are the forgotten islands. Although they look like an exotic vacation spot, there is no luxury here. The villagers will never go to a mall, taste an ice cube, or drive a car. Instead, they'll fish, bathe, and wash dishes in the same stagnant ponds. Even worse, they'll drink from them. There are no schools or medical clinics, and the people have never been taught how to keep clean. So there's a lot of sickness and death. Life seems hopeless. But a team of 18 Gospel for Asia missionaries is changing all that. to island, these men are bringing the light of Christ into the darkness of these hidden waterways. Taj, the leader of the team, is determined to take this message of hope despite facing persecution and death threats. It is not we who have been doing ministry, but it is God who have been doing ministry through us. 
The islanders have formed a close-knit society, and foreigners aren't easily accepted. But through the missionaries, God has begun to lower social barriers. As a result, Taj and the others have developed personal relationships with hundreds of villagers, allowing them to share the gospel openly. When our Benjamin brother holded her leg and when he began to offer the prayer, she was com completely moved. <laughs> and then she told, you know, my, you are my son, you are like my son. And then Benjamin replied, you are like my mother. Never worry about anything. Jesus will heal you. Her family members only firstly they came to believe in Jesus. Now she is around 100 years old. We began to pray and then God opened the door for this bridge of Hope Center. Then I began to pray, Lord. We start at least. 20 bridge of hope center in this island. And this coming generation should be the generation of Lord Jesus Christ. I began to pray that they may have enough resources of water. God has answered the prayers for clean water. Instead of drawing water from stagnant ponds, fresh water now flows through Jesus' wells. These island inhabitants have seen the true love that the missionaries have for them and are eager to learn more about Jesus. In less than two years, 44 islands have been reached and 66 thriving Christian fellowships have been planted. In fact, on one small island, every single villager has decided to follow Christ. The Lord is working through these missionaries in miraculous ways. Everywhere these brothers go, people are saved even for boat drivers. Yet there are still many islands where the name of Jesus has never been uttered. These people are hungry to hear about the Savior, and they need someone to tell them. As Taj and his team rejoice in what God has done so far, he and his team pray that more missionaries will hear the call to go to these hidden people. To speak. morning. Well, as Dr. KP said, um, you know, we're here. We want to um, just extend blessing and thanks that uh, many of you guys have already gotten this uh, book right here, Revolution World Missions, correct? Raise your hand if you've gotten a copy of this. All right, good, good, good bit of you. There's more on the tables there. If you haven't gotten a copy, this book absolutely rocked my world. Over 20 years ago, I had no idea about national missionaries. I always thought it was something like you or I going. We're all called into the Great Commission. We know that. Um, but God has given us a unique place and time to serve him. Some of us are called to go. Others are called to send. But we all have to do something. When I first heard that there's 3.1 billion people remaining unreached with the gospel, they've never heard the name of Jesus. I let that sink into my heart and my mind realizing I bear some of that burden and that responsibility before the Lord Jesus Christ, and guess what? You do as well. And it's not out of guilt or manipulation or emotions, but it's out of reality going, what do you want to invest in? What do you want to count? I tell you this, in these nations, you can go and link your life with a brother and sister or brothers and sisters, maybe even a whole boat team. Grab 18 missionaries. God has given you the means to do so, do that. And we can make it really, really simple for you. If you want to give today, there's a little card in there. You'll have to pull that out, fill that out, and give it back to someone at the table. Um, they'll, they'll show you that there at the table. But if you just simply want to grab them and take them home and pray and support them, you can just grab them today. And this is, a, again, a very unique opportunity. I encourage you, go grab and, and 
link your life with them. That's the greatest privilege my family and I have had is to link our lives with these brothers and sisters. And I'd like to pray over you guys now uh, out of Colossians 1, 12. Lord Jesus, you are the one who has equipped us, qualified us, to be partakers of the divine inheritance of the saints who are in the light. Lord, this is all about you. I pray for my brothers and sisters. You would continue to grow them in the grace and knowledge of you, Lord Jesus, that they would sense your presence and your peace, and they would be desirous, Lord, to participate with you in your great commission work. Lord, grow us. We ask all this in your precious and most holy.